I was making more money off the real estate than it was the law practice. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Senziana, host of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, the chef, the father, six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy, Gino Barbo. Gene, how's it going? Mr. Stenziano, I'm doing great, bro. How are you? Always making it happen, big man. Very excited about today's guest. Uh, we're going to learn a lot today. We have uh, one of the, the industry legends coming on the show. So without further ado, we have Sam Freshman. Sam is the author of Principles of Real Estate Syndication, the Industry Acknowledged Bible on Syndication, and founder of the private real estate investment firm Standard Management Company. Sam, uh, Sam is admired by many, and we're very pleased to have him on the show. So again, without further ado, Sam, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Let's, let's take it back a couple of years and uh, tell, us, tell us how you got started in this, uh, this crazy game of real estate. Started in, uh, well, I graduated uh, law school in 1957, a little while back. Couple, couple, couple of years back. A couple of years back, I uh, went to Stanford, came down to LA because my parents had moved there and I wanted to live in the pool house and uh, said to my dad, dad, you told me to go to law school. I was originally pre-med, I didn't like it, so switched. But you didn't tell me what kind of law, I discovered there's all kinds, you know, tax law, patent law, uh, all kinds of stuff without hesitating. He'd only been in California for about uh, two weeks. He said, go into real estate. That's where all the money's made in California. So I got a real estate license as well as uh, uh, a bar, I passed the bar and uh, went to work for Jacob Stern, which was the uh, original owner in the 1800s of uh, all kinds of uh, Hollywood, uh, Hollywood, everything that was Hollywood, uh, La Mirada, La Habra, maybe about six different communities. I worked for them for a year and then uh, opened my law office, uh, practiced law, did some real estate on the side. By 1982, uh, I was making more money off the real estate than it was the law practice. Mm -hmm. I went to the, my partners uh, and uh, gave them the keys and said, here, you guys can have this. I can't afford <laughs> to do law anymore because I was making in one year what I would make in 10 years of law practice and uh, just went on from there. Sam, can you tell us the progression of how you how you got into the real estate and how you built it up and within twenty years and re replaced your income tenfold? I mean that that's a big process. And, uh, more than that, did you like law? Did you once you went into law? Well, did you I like law? law? I like law certain mm -hmm. parts of it. I didn't like going to court, but I liked the transactional law and writing contracts, and uh, uh, did a lot of speaking. Uh, on, uh, I was an expert witness pretty early. Um, and I still do some of that occasionally. Mm -hmm. Um, that's where the fun is because as a lawyer, you're expected to be an advocate for your client. Mm -hmm. As an expert witness, you have to appear to be neutral. Mm -hmm. So I had to train the lawyers when they hired me who got a little over aggressive. I said, look, you're going to blow this case and kill my uh, expert witness testimony. Mm -hmm. She let me throw a few things to the other side. Mm -hmm. it won't be determinative, but will uh, show that I'm somewhat neutral. And so, how'd you get into real estate? How did I get the real estate? How did you get into the real estate business? How did you start investing? Were you oh, syndicating deals, or were you buying deals yeah, on your own? No, I was syndicating. I had clients. Mm -hmm. They had money to invest, and uh, in those days, I wouldn't look at it unless it was a nine cap. And today, of course, uh, I'm lucky to get a four and a half. Five. <laughs> but, uh, uh, get ripped off, Sam. <laughs> so uh, the investors get a uh, uh, preference. Mm -hmm. And in those days, nine or 10 percent. And then if I exceeded that, why I'd share in that anywhere from a third to a half, 
the X of the profits over and above the preference. Mm -hmm. And it's still pretty much that way. It's relatively simple. Um, and uh, I like real estate because uh, once it's, when it, when it was in the law practice, once the case was over, I got to start working all over again. But in real estate, if I uh, buy a uh, shopping center or an apartment building or something like that, once I get it, uh, uh, rent it, uh, I'm done. Mm -hmm. I give it to the uh, management department. Uh, we do manage almost all our own properties. And uh, it's great. The main, the main thing, and pretty much is you, when you and I were talking earlier, um, is never sell. People ask me, how do you get so rich? I said, it's very simple. I'm not smart. I'm rather uh, I'm clever, but not smart. <laughs> and uh, uh, I learned very early. I made a lot of mistakes. The biggest mistakes were I didn't buy enough mm -hmm. and I sold too soon. Mm -hmm. So by the end of the 1960s, we became strictly buy and hold. Uh, and the, the key to getting really rich is to never sell, uh, hardly ever sell anything anymore, um, and uh, not borrow too much. I have friends that are worth a lot more than I am, but they take out 75 and 80% loans and get wiped out in the next recession. Mm -hmm. There's six major recessions and survived every one of them we get down to where we can only pay the mortgage <laughs> sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, 2007, I got really beat up in, in uh, Vegas, in Nevada. And, uh, but we hung on and now we're getting double what we were getting pre 2007. Mm -hmm. uh, almost all our excess cash flow uh, was wiped out. Uh, at that time. And I've been through six sessions like that since uh, the 1960s. So Sam, how do you, how do you convey to your investors, Hey, I'm going to buy and I'm not going to, I'm not going to give you your money back. I'm going to hold this asset forever because we're in that cost right now. That's what we want to do. We do it internally ourselves. We love buying deals ourselves because just me, Jake, and another partner, if we don't take a draw this month, Hey Jake, the septic fields went out. We're not getting paid. It's okay. Next month, let's refi this money and let's roll into another deal. How do you convey to your investors that that's the right way to do it? Because I love the model personally. Well, uh, there's pros and cons. There's a lot of people that make money uh, turning it over quickly, mm -hmm. three three to five years. The millennials generally want to do that. They don't understand. But then there's also a lot of 70 and 80 year old guys at the country club that are buying for their grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tell them right up front, uh, we are not probably not going to sell this property if it performs well forever, hopefully. Um, but uh, we do have a situation where uh, under certain circumstances, they can back out. For example, if somebody has a divorce or they're moving out of town or uh, they're changing their estate, we do an appraisal of the property and we buy them out at 90% mm -hmm what they would have got if we sold the property. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Sam, what would make you want to sell a property if you had to? Uh, oh, well, we have out of the couple hundred that we've been through, I think we only, we only have currently uh, narrowed it down to this. this but we bought and sold uh, earlier mm -hmm. in uh, 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, uh, if the area deteriorates, we did that once uh, in uh, Vegas where the, the particular neighborhood declined. Mm -hmm. uh, or, and in the shopping centers, uh, some of our partners pressured us. Mm -hmm. We were major partners with Northwestern Mutual Life for uh, uh, about 30 years. And uh, we had 6,000 units with them, yeah, but we only had 14 properties, large ones. 
Wow. Mm-hmm. And we had shopping centers with them. We also had Kemper, I don't know if they were on anymore, but it was another major life insurance company. And uh, uh, they wanted to sell, and it was 90% their money. Mm-hmm. We had a, a typical deal would be a, a 70% first mortgage. We, today, now that we're, we've got a lot of cash around, uh, we only take a 60% mortgage. Mm-hmm. We sort of stress test it, like the government does the banks. We want to be able to make the mortgage payment if the interest rate, if the rents go down thirty percent. That's mm-hmm. a stress test. To make sure that we don't get wiped out in a recession. Um, and uh, that's uh, how it works. Uh, we lose one half of our prospects because they want something that's going to be sold in five years or something. More of a flip model, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's okay. It's a different way. Of doing mm-hmm. it. The problem is if you get your hands on too much cash, you spend it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Gino talking to his wife. <laughs> hey, Mr. stenziano has got the SAT credit cards. Have you ever heard of that? It's Starbucks, Amazon, and Target. His wife's using the credit card and he sees those three charges over and over and over again. So... Talk about spending. Every my week. wife, my Every wife week. likes that all the time. So, Sam, what do you like when you look at an investment? I know you have, you haven't bought that many deals in the in the you know most recently, but when you're when you're evaluating an asset, how do you evaluate it for? I'm going to buy this thing and hold this thing for a long term. What are you looking for? Well, uh, we're looking for the trend. Number one is the area improving, mm-hmm. same or declining. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have occasionally bought where it's it's fairly stable if we can get a high enough return to justify that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have some property in Oklahoma that's like that. that uh, we bought it at a 12 cap and it's just sort of stayed there. <laughs> in the floor, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Could be worse. Uh, yeah. yeah. That was, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago. It's now free and clear. Eventually get the mortgage paid off. We do something different than most uh, syndicators. We don't refinance. Mm-hmm. We work towards getting the property free and clear. And we really sleep at night. <laughs> uh, that takes about uh, anywhere from 20 to 30 years. Um, so uh, about uh, oh, maybe 10, 15% of our portfolio now, there's no debt. Uh, when we started out with a maybe a 60, 70% loan. Wow. And uh, that's when things get really, really good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, we, we usually factor in about um, that's 3% per year average growth. Uh, sometimes it exceeds that, sometimes uh, it makes it. Uh, a few times it has it, but mm-hmm. generally, generally, so compound interest is a tremendous magic, you know, 3% a year, every 20 years or whatever, if nothing else happened, the value of the property double. Mm-hmm. Well, I love that. So Sam, let me ask you, um, since you're the king of syndicators, what, what do you tell the listeners, the, the pros and the cons of syndication? Because everyone thinks the syndication is just this great tool. We call it a tool in the toolbox. Can you give us some of the pros of it and then maybe some of the cons of syndication? Well, the pros are it's you're, uh, increasing your returns tremendously. Uh, you, mm-hmm. have, you have, let's say, $100,000 to invest. You can put it into a property and own the whole thing yourself. Small property, maybe mm-hmm. units or something. Uh, <clears throat> or it used to be. <laughs> 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 or you can go out and get nine other people and buy a million dollar property. Mm-hmm. And you, and when you bring the investors in, you're going to take uh, eventually uh, 20% of the profit mm-hmm. for putting the deal together. Mm-hmm. So uh, if, if you started out to make it simple, let's say at a 
uh, uh, five cap, mm -hmm. and you bought a hundred thousand uh, dollar property, you get a five cap on a hundred thousand dollars. Forgetting the growth, uh, if you take that and and just take um, 10% of the profits, mm -hmm. get nine friends to also put up $100,000, then you're making a uh, five cap, uh, you're making nine points, 20% mm -hmm. or 5% on the, on the, uh, eight, uh, the, eight other, uh, eight or the nine other investors, you're making, you're only making uh, maybe four percent on your own, but you're making thirteen percent versus five. Mm -hmm. Just just by sin, by the simple act of syndicating, if you purchased correctly, mm -hmm. you're making three four times what you'd make if mm -hmm. you just bought your own property. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that there's you can buy larger properties, mm -hmm. and there's great great uh, advantages to that. But for example, if I have a fifty unit property. It's going to cost me maybe forty thousand dollars to have a manager, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if I have a two hundred unit property, it's not going to cost me one hundred and sixty uh, units. It's only going to cost me instead of forty, it might cost me seventy. Mm -hmm. But per unit, the price has dropped in half. Mm -hmm. Economies of scale, yes. There's, there's a lot of scale, particularly in the labor portion. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have three, 300 units and you only have, uh, you have, you can have two on-site me uh, mechanics to take care of all the equipment and everything mm -hmm. uh, versus paying uh, outside electricians and all that. Mm -hmm. So there, there's tremendous savings on scale. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but you hadn't thought about it. Very few people think about that because they they want to own their own deal. They want to have to deal with nine other investors who are going to mm -hmm. tell why oh, you should have painted this room with this. Or you have that. But it, it's worth it. Mm -hmm. Not with that aggravation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, every once in a while, you have a nasty uh, partner. And, yeah. But uh, it hasn't been that bad, really. I think uh, I think we have maybe 40, 50 investors, and we only have one or two that are really sort of uh, aggravations. <laughs> so, so you would say that the pros are you're 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 leveraging money, you're getting much better returns, right. you're having scalability, you're having the economies of scale. I think you're also able to build a business from that also. That's the rosy picture of it. The, the cons are you're going to have to deal with investors. You have to deal with that. You know, it's a Pareto rule. If you're going to have, you know, a hundred investors, I wouldn't say 20, but you're going to have three or four or five. They're going to drive you nuts, but it's worth it. Everybody out there. And it, Sam's talking about the long game. He's not talking about getting rich in the next six to 12 months. He's talking about buying a deal and playing the long game, which I think everyone has. To, when you're building a business, it's like building a multifamily portfolio. You're not going to get rich overnight. That's why a lot of people don't do it. Um, and you know, the syndication that Jake was talking about the fix and flip the flip model where people are in and three years later, they're out, they made their fees and they're onto the next golden goose. They just slayed this one. They're onto the next one. I don't think that's what we're promoting. I think we're just talking about buying a really good deal, trying to run that deal, trying to make it as efficient as possible, trying to get some great investors on board who share your vision. You know, you have to be honest with the investors up front and say, this is what I want to do. And if it's not a good fit, that's okay. And just move on to the next one. So uh, I wanted to recap all of that. Continually adding to that depreciation pool too. You know, continually mm -hmm. bringing new deals in to add to the depreciation pool. Um, one, other, one other thing that uh, I want to get across. Um, sure. That is, when we buy a property today, the best we can do is get a 5% return. Mm-hmm. In the neighborhoods we want to be, mm -hmm. and usually what less. Mm -hmm. We have to find something that we, we can value add. Mm -hmm. So we're getting, let's say, a five percent return 
uh, on a property that's just built last year and there's, there's not much more you can do to, to it. Mm -hmm. Or you buy a property that was built in 1980 and you're going to you can redo the apartments, you can fix up the grounds, and in most of the uh, neighborhoods we look, look at, because we're looking where the trend is up, we can make 20% on the money we put into the property that mm -hmm. we bought. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we're constantly, as we're, as we're improving the property, the yield is increasing. Mm -hmm. Maybe a half a point, a point a year, two points a year. Mm -hmm. And that excess, we don't distribute that excess to the partners. If it's a 6% distribution, that's what they're gonna get for a while. Mm -hmm. All that excess that we're building goes back into the property, and in ten years we've doubled its value. Mm, I love that. That's awesome. Um, off, off camera, we had spoken about where we are in the cycle since you've been through various cycles. A lot of them. We talked about being in extra innings, and it's overextended by a couple of years. Where do you see happening in the next recession? Do you see? I mean, because. Right now, we're talking about artificially low interest rates, so we've never had something like this for the last going 10 years. Going down, yeah. So, and they're going down. So what do you think, what, what, do you, what are your feelings are going forward? Do you see these cap rates staying compressed? Do you see the, um, because also, Sam, the other thing that's going on, which I think is people don't talk about as much as a student debt, 1.6 trillion in student debt, where I was just talking to Jake about it right now. People are renting homes. The, the American dream is not having a house. I mean, unless you're Gino who has six kids and you need a house. I mean, I mean, I, I wouldn't be living in a house. I'd be renting if I had one kid or if I was, you know, just married or just single. So where do you see it going in the future, the, the, the uh, cap rates and, and rates of return? Well, uh, I don't think we'll uh, get back to, uh, to 10% for a while. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, it'll be interesting to see what, what happens here with this uh, uh, thing that's uh, started in China and, and uh, mm -hmm. coming around. Um, I, I'm not smart enough to figure <laughs> 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 uh, all, all I can do is just keep continuing to... Uh, we, we do two things. One is, of course, we buy property and we fix it up mm -hmm. and uh, look to the long term. And we also have a short term business with a gap at bridge lending. So we do finance other people that are on a fix and flip. Mm, okay. uh, we'll, we'll lend uh, anywhere from three weeks to three years. Okay. Uh, and, uh, for example, uh, banks. Uh, most of our loans come from banks on referral. Uh, some brokers will refer to us as well. They have a client who's buying a, an empty building. Banks don't like to lend on empty buildings. We don't mm -hmm. care. Uh, if we like it, we'll lend on it. Uh, so uh, we get empty buildings. Uh, we look for um, uh, other things that uh, banks uh, don't um, generally care for. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we're, uh, we're conservative. We go in a, to our 60, 65%. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're looking for people that have some money uh, and uh, <clears throat> are, are conscious of the interest rate. Mm -hmm. We'll charge anywhere from six to to eight percent, where a lot of the private lenders go into you know, five, right? Ten and twelve. Wow. Um, but they're charging much more interest. Than mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so uh, we're conservative, but if uh, somebody uh, needs a gap or bridge loan, we'll 
be happy to talk to them. Mm-hmm. Keep your eyes open. I'll pay your referral fee. <laughs> <laughs> We got your back. <laughs> Jake, I like it. He's got the multifaceted multifamily. He's doing some lending. He's owning apartments. He's doing property management. He's syndicating. He's doing he's doing it all. So and he's closing go- he's closing deals on the show today. So it's perfect. <laughs> before we go to the short answer questions, uh, what what would you tell investors out there? How would you tell an investor that wants to get into multifamily? How how should they start to get into multifamily? What's the I guess the framework or what are the next steps that they need to take to get into multifamily? Well, find a partner that's in it. Work with Mm -hmm. them for a year or two. Mm -hmm. Um, There's, uh, so first of all, it's a lot easier to raise money that way. Um, Mm -hmm. Because the investor only asks one question, general. That's how much skin do you have in this deal? Yes. So if you say, Let's say you hook up with some guy that's very successful and you just have a small piece of the deal uh, and you're going to go uh, out and you know, work for him looking for deals. Or, uh, um, you, uh, you get an investor and you say, well, the sponsors, you know, I'm not a sponsor in this deal. We've put in X dollars. Well, actually, 80% of it is the other guy's money, but you mm-hmm. learn it. And I recommend that people usually do that for anywhere from uh, maybe one to three years. Mm-hmm. And then as they go on, go on and, and they build up their uh, capital and their experience, then they then go out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have uh, graduates <laughs> from Standard Management Company that have gone, gone out and they've been here usually a lot longer, five to seven years, but those guys go out and they're making a couple hundred million dollars now. Mm-hmm. I've got maybe four or five that I could uh, level off on one hand. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're very proud of them. A couple of cases, I tell them, you guys are too smart to continue to be here working <laughs> out and uh, do it yourself. I like that. It's a good idea. Education times action equals results. Getting in the game and partnering with somebody who's doing it and leveraging their talents, maybe leveraging their intelligence, their their experience, and their network too. Love that. All right, gang, let's take a quick time out to hear from our sponsor. Gino and I are super excited to tell you about the audiobook version of The Honeybee, which was recently released. The Honeybee tells the story of Noah, a disappointed, disaffected salesman who feels like his life is going nowhere until the day he has a chance encounter with a man named Tom Barnum, the beekeeper. In his charming, down-home way, Tom, the bee man, teaches Noah and his wife Emma how to grow their personal wealth using the lessons he learned from his beekeeping passion. In the audio version, Gino and I sat down for an exclusive interview after each each chapter where we elaborate on the stings we felt throughout the business, the importance of scaling up, and how we've been able to create multiple streams of revenue. For more information and to get your copy of the audiobook, visit jakeandgino.com forward slash honeybee. All right, we are back. We want to dive into your habits, Sam. What is your best habit for success? Something you may do on a daily basis or a weekly basis that's led to uh, your success? Well, I guess uh, uh, marketing is one mm-hmm. thing. Uh, this idea of not pushing to <clears throat> to, to uh, make people happy by distributing the money. Uh, <laughs> discipline. Putting in discipline. Uh, yeah, it's probably probably discipline and. Uh, uh, Picking good partners and uh, uh, due diligence, mainly uh, what happens later is the result of what happens before you buy the property. Mm -hmm. Uh, You um, look at uh, like uh, tenant troubles. Um, If you have trouble with tenants, it's just you're not doing your due diligence on the tenants. Uh, to the extent you should. There's all kinds of services you can get to see if they've uh, committed a crime or done something else. Or, uh, try and find out uh, if you can who their last landlord was and ask 
them about uh, so uh, a lot of due diligence mm -hmm. uh, we uh, generally want to have uh, at least 30 days uh, to uh, check the property out make sure that uh, uh, there's no environmental problems tenant problem things of that nature so it's just a matter of being careful uh, and uh, uh, sometimes um, you have to be uh, a little bit uh, aggressive uh, on uh, looking, but uh, I don't. Uh, I don't know uh, anything other than that. So I want to share this uh, story with the listeners. When I contacted. Uh, Mr. Freshman to be on the podcast. I think it was a Saturday that I had reached out to him and Sunday my phone rings and it's a Beverly Hills number. And I'm like, this must be some telemarketer or somebody. And I picked it up and it was Sam on the phone. And I'm like, it's Sunday. I'm like, he's my hero. He's working his butt <laughs> off. He's, you know, I mean, he's been doing this for 30 years. So for me, the lesson is I think Sam has an intense joy for what he does. I think we all need to find that in what we do. We need to find our sole purpose and our passion. But the second thing is you have to work hard. You have to put a lot of time and a lot of effort into it and, and look at it as part of the long game. But what struck me was no one calls me on Sundays. I had a phone call from Sunday on Sundays in real estate. I was so happy. I called Jacob. I said, Sam Freshman called me on a Sunday. We scheduled a podcast. <laughs> so for me, that was like, that's my hero right there. Yeah. The other thing is, look, I, I uh, don't have a boat. I don't have a plane. Uh, I uh, don't play golf. I don't play tennis. I love buying property. Uh, all my kids are, are basically gone. I see them maybe once a month for dinner or something. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all in, either in college or out in their own businesses. So what am I going to do? <laughs> Just I can around? live in that simple good life. I can call you Uncle Sam because I do. I have none of those except tennis. I like to play tennis and the kids are around all the time. But other than that, I love to do deals. I hate golf. No boat for me, no plane for me. So, I mean, it's just, I, I, I feel it from you. I, I totally agree. And it's not really about making money as, as much as it is having fun, enjoying yourself, serving others, and, you know, getting those emails back from investors and saying, did a great job on this, or an employee writing back to you and saying, hey, this is great. So being locked in and being active and, and it's just, it's just giving back. The, is, the, I, the other thing, I guess, uh, which is probably part of my success is, uh, focusing on contacts, mm -hmm. networking. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I've always been, uh, network has always been, been a hobby with me. I have 10,000 names uh, in my data bank mm -hmm. uh, now. Of course, that was accumulated over the 60 years. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, if we send out something and we've got a property to buy, uh, uh, generally, um, I'm not too far down the list before I raise the money. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. uh, so uh, doing networking, doing speaking. I started speaking right after I got out of college and uh, um, uh, that, uh, that helps. Mm -hmm. uh, get out there and speak, go to meetings, go to where the money is. One of the tricks I've found is, you know, you get a letter in the mail and somebody's offering you a free dinner because mm -hmm. they want to sell you something, uh, some kind of investment or something. Uh, I used to always go to those things because I'd pick up my investors. Uh, <laughs> now that's innovative thinking. That is a great tip because I've, I've got those all the time in my house and I never go. Oh, and I'm, I'm oh. short-sighted clearly. It's a great, it's, oh man. <laughs> you know, why do I want to go to this and listen to this pitch about the, this guy and his crazy soap that he's selling or whatever? Uh, because those are people who are interested in making investments. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could 
sit there at the dinner table, you're going to meet three or four people. And uh, uh, so I used to do that a lot. Uh, that kind of thing. All right, Jake. That's, okay. that's on the list to do, yeah, bro. Got it. <laughs> Sam, what, what do you think about uh, having your own management company versus using third-party management? That's an interesting thing. I've always done it ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, in the earlier days, uh, we'd start out, if we, if we had a uh, 100 unit or 200 unit building, that was the first one, we'd use a local management company uh, until we had maybe a thousand units in the area. We have like, uh, I think uh, 2,000 units in, in Vegas and about a thousand units in Reno. And in both those cities, we use local management for the first couple uh, purchases. Uh, that, but once we got established, uh, then we put our own operation in. Uh, I know some of my graduates, they won't touch the management. Uh, we work with a company called Gelt, a bunch of young guys that I mentored. And in seven years, they grew to the same size I put together in 60 years. Mm -hmm. They uh, only use third party management and they focus strictly on looking for property. It is a, it is a uh, uh, something that takes time. And you know that you guys, I think said, do your own management. Some guys say they can't afford to do that. They want to just focus on and think about buying more property. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd say, from my own standpoint, uh, I'm happy with it. And I'm doing, uh, my growth has been strictly value add on my properties. So I've had to do a lot of attention anyway. So it turned out that there was probably a good thing for this market. Mm -hmm. But uh, I know guys that have done very well, much better than I have even. Uh, and they only use outside management. <laughs> but there's there's a lot of things you can do for on the properties. <laughs> For example, where does the money go? The money goes first into the rents, which go through the management company. We get a lot of, of uh, credit from that money. We have a line of credit at the bank because we have millions of dollars in the bank uh, from the, handling the rent ourselves rather than having a third party. We also get paid for that. It's small. Mm -hmm. yeah and a half percent or something, two percent. <clears throat> but uh, again, the, uh, the advantages of scale, as we talked about, I probably wouldn't do it today if I didn't have uh, a, a big uh, portfolio. Mm -hmm. The management, you know, management's usually what, about three percent in, in multifamily, maybe two and a half. If, real big property <laughs> well that's pretty good <laughs> it's uh, you know it may cost you uh, may give you let's say uh, two hundred thousand dollars in management fees you're looking at larger properties like we do two three hundred thousand dollars it doesn't cost us that much uh, because we have the advantage of scale mm -hmm. uh, but then again uh, I would knock it because of some of the biggest guys I know uh, will only use Alliance or AMC or one of the big management companies uh, and uh, focus on uh, buying property or selling property or something. Since we don't buy or sell, we can spend more time <laughs> focusing on improving what we have. Mm -hmm. That's been most of what we've done over the last three or four years. Prior to that, of course, we were out there very aggressively grabbing what we could. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, any book recommendations that you want to share with the listeners? Well, there's Principles of Real Estate Syndication. There's also another book called uh, um, You're Never Old Enough to Know Better which is the one that uh, I think your partner just said he gave to his kids. Mm -hmm. uh, 
how to live your life. Uh, so all the things that, that I've learned. Uh, the, the example is Miss Heikinen. <clears throat> Miss Heikinen was my high school social science teacher. I loved her, but the world of her and she uh, sort of uh, uh, gave me good grades. I was a good student in her class. Um, and she made an assignment for everybody to give a talk to the class. And I, there's no question I gave the best presentation. All the guys in the class gave the best presentation. I got a B plus, Marianne got an A. I went to Ms. Hyken and I said, Ms. Hyken, I've always gotten an A. This is my first B plus in your class. Why didn't Marianne get an A? Well, Sam, it's true. Your speech was better than hers. Than anybody's in the class. However, Marianne did the best she could, and you could have done better. Hmm. And that has stuck with me. <laughs> you still want that A. <laughs> but no, but that. So when I get into a large transaction, I always think of as hiking. You know, wait a minute, let's not, even though I could do this or that, with my hands tied behind my back, I better dig in and do the best I can. Uh, and uh, so I have stuff like that uh, in the, uh, I'll give you one more. My wife and I are going down the Yangtze River to visit China. And uh, we get on the boat, and uh, we've been told to don't take the the cabin room that they give you with your tour because it's sort of like they used to have it in the train. So you know the bed comes out of the wall and it's all that. Ask to see the the, the regular room, which is a hundred dollars extra. Or whatever it was. So when we get on, we see, they show us the, and we said, can we see the regular room? Yeah, it's a hundred dollars extra. So we go there. And we said, do you have anything better than this? Uh, it was nice. It was like a hotel, but yes, he says, we have two uh, apartments on the boat, which are about three times the size. He said, let's see those. Nobody's taking them yet. So we go to the back of the boat, there's a uh, big outside area to sit for these two, bigger than for the other 70. Uh, and I said, okay. I said, how much extra is that? And he said, $500. And uh, I looked out and we'd left the dock and we were in the middle of the river now. And I said, Tell you what, I'll give you two fifty. He says, I can't do that. Only the captain could agree to that. I said, What happens now that we're out into the river? He says, They'll be vacant for the rest of the trip. <laughs> I said, Go ask the captain. He came back a little cheaper. So the captain said, Yeah. <laughs> so stories like that, you know. You never know till you ask. <laughs> That's right. That's one of the things I always teach my uh, new uh, employees. Never fail to ask. You'll be surprised at uh, one in three or one in four people will give it to you. Mm -hmm. Love that. Um, that's happened many times. You, what do you want? You want $20 million? No. You know, we can only give you 15. No. Eight times it's going to be turned down. The other times it's well, I'll go back and ask. Him. It said we'll take it. Yeah. Always ask. <laughs> Sam, what's the uh, the best way for folks to get a hold of you if they want one of those uh, those bridge loans? The best way would be to to uh, call us three one zero four one zero twenty three hundred. Extension 5306. 310 410 
2300 extension 5306. That's probably the best. Um, and then uh, uh, there's a couple others. Uh, five, extension 5331, that's Erin. She's in charge of processing the inquiries. And the first one was, was my extension. Um, S, uh, and then there's sfreshman at standardmanagement.com. Wow. So that's the email. Do you know my two favorite quotes, never sell and I, I wasn't making enough money practice in law. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, Jake. I'm sorry, I can't afford to work in law. That's what it was. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, hit me up a little bit more because there's there's a lot here. I mean, the couple of things that I take away um, when you're looking for property management or third party property management, check out what your priorities are. If you're looking to scale, that might not be the right choice to you. But from Sam's story about his social studies teacher, it seemed as if property management allowed him to add value and not leave any money on the table. Maximize for return. Maximize yes. return on that one. And he wasn't looking just to scale and just look to grow and grow his ego, but he wanted to eat was on his plate, focus on that. And he knew he, he, he could do a better job. So if he thought he gives it to a third party property management, maybe that third party might not be able to pull it through like he does. So that's a lesson when you learn when you're younger in life that sticks with you. That's really awesome. Um, the second one is the supply and demand. It's really crucial. Jake, you made me start reading Sam Zell's book about supply and demand. And it just brought me to that story also. If there's if there's no if there's no demand for something, then you then you have it, right? Right now there's such a demand for apartments and cap rates are really compressed. But that story really pulls it into me as far as the supply and demand goes. Right. And um, like I said, just look at your priorities. I think syndication is an awesome tool in the toolbox. It's a great way to scale. Sam had mentioned multiple times about the economies of scale and growing your portfolio and focusing on that. So I tell everyone to get out there and buy Sam's book because it's a great book. It's not an easy read on your first read. You've got to read it a couple times. It took me a couple times to, to understand it, but his other books are awesome. They're awesome for your kids. So if you're out there looking to find something for your children to start learning about money, uh, I would definitely look into those books. Excellent. Sam, thank you so uh, much for your time. With regard to the books, mm -hmm. yes. uh, there's a series called The Smartest Way to Save. Uh, that series is for your wife. Be sure you buy that one of those books. And give it to I will. Will, will that help with the, the Starbucks, Amazon, and Target, Sam? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the smartest way to save, the smartest way to save more, and the smartest way to save big. Uh, Excellent. Good. Thanks, Sam. We appreciate your time today. Sam, okay. really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay. Good seeing you guys. Okay.